event with uh, help of Leap, uh, um, who just spoke uh, with you. We have um, several people who are helping us in this uh, Zoom technical endeavor. Um, uh, Ezra Glukman, where are you? Sure, wait to us. He, Ezra is a Rusa volunteer. Uh, he is helping us with all things technical. Um, uh, we also are very, very lucky to have uh, um, Anatoly Samachorno, uh, who is uh, uh, um, waving to us right now. He is an uh, amazing uh, interpreter, and he will simultaneously interpret into Russian language. Uh, event will be in English, so if you are only Russian speaking and you want to continue just in Russian, please see the chat. In the chat, we have uh, uh, the number to call for you to hear uh, simultaneous r Russian translation. Okay, so what is the goal of our event? The goal of our event is uh, uh, several fold, uh, fold, and one of that one of this important thing is education. We want to really understand what defund the police statement means, uh, what it means in general, and what it means potentially to you. Uh, we will hear today uh, different opinions, and we would like to uh, encourage these different opinions to come out here so we can have an open discussion. Of course, this discussion uh, will have to be very civil. Uh, and I'm not afraid to, to use mute button or, or, or just uh, even uh, uh, throw a person out if, uh, if it's not, uh, uh, if, if the conversation is not uh, respectful. Please, let's respect each other. Okay, um, from Rus LGBT, I wanted to say that uh, Rus LGBT is, is supporting uh, BLM movement. Uh, we made a statement long time ago. We, uh, our leadership is very clear about it. At the same time, we, we do know that uh, there are people in Russian-speaking LGBT community and, and also in Russian-speaking uh, community uh, in New York, in, in the um, United States, that m may not necessarily agree to those statements. And, and right now, we, we would like to um, give an opportunity for uh, both sides, or maybe four th sides, all the sides to speak and uh, uh, and be heard, be heard. Um, a little bit about uh, logistics today. It's it's going to be a panel. Obviously, it's going to be on Zoom, not in person. We uh, we will ask uh, uh, our guests to talk uh, and make a statement, and then we will ask questions, and then uh, also we will encourage you to ask them questions as well. Please use the chat, uh, put, your, uh, put your questions into the chat and, and uh, they will go directly to our host, Leib, and, and, and he will uh, at some point later on uh, tell this, uh, um, ask the questions. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we will get to everyone who will have a question or even a statement. Okay. Now, uh, uh, a little bit about our, our panel, and uh, um, after that, immediately to the panel. Uh, so, uh, our panel today is uh, Lyosha Garshkov, our uh, Rusoko president, active, activist, and uh, uh, PhD uh, in uh, politi political science. Uh, he is an uh, amazing guy who works with us for a long time. He is very knowledgeable about the subject. Uh, he also um, uh, 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 educated himself as well uh, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that he presents uh, uh, the history of, uh, uh, of policing and what it means and, and different options in front of us right now. Uh, the, the next panelist is Vernon Stanley, Vernon. Uh, wave to us. Where are you? Oh, here we are. Okay. Werner is a, uh, is a member of RUSA. He is with RUSA for over six years. Uh, he assisted many people um, 
Russian-speaking LGBT people who came here as asylum seekers. He has deep uh, uh, relationship with Russian-speaking LGBT community, and and we are very very happy uh, to have him here with us uh, to to discuss the subject. Um, we also have with us a uh, detective. Hello. Uh, hi, hi, Detective Carl Locke. He is LGBTIQ liaison to the chief of NYPD. We uh, work with Carl uh, on many different occasions, including uh, uh, on Brighton Beach Pride security. We know him uh, and we trust him. And we would like uh, uh, Carl to present uh, his own opinion and also uh, um, a position of police on uh, on different options uh, about funding of a police and structure of a police. Um, thank you for being here, Carl. Um, and our last but not least guest is Sasha Raskin Yin. She is um, a Russian speaking uh, immigrant. Uh, she's from a fam family of Russian speaking immigrants, and uh, she's a member of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. And, uh, uh, and and she is involved uh, in uh, um, in in work on uh, police uh, uh, on police reform, and she will tell us uh, about her and organizational work. And uh, after that, we will uh, ask each other questions. Okay. So, uh, Liam, before I continue, uh, how we're we doing? Do we have anybody in waiting room? No, no, everybody is already. Here. Everybody's here. Okay. Okay. So um, uh, I'm gonna uh, present to you, Lyosha Garshkov. Lyosha, please um, tell us about what what, what 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 does it mean policing? Why do we need policing? What does it mean defund police, abolish police? Just just give us give us an idea of what we're looking at here. Great, great. Thank you. It's really very interesting to have a panel like that because. Uh, being from certain countries, uh, you will never think that you will be conflicting within about the certain institutions because precisely in our countries, police do not represent the people. And 90% of people in Russia, for example, do not trust the police because police is the number one corrupt system. And you come here and you hear and you see the unrest which is going on. And personally, you have to uh, revalue right uh, certain things and I've been trying to hold on to that and see and people already call me radical I'm not that radical I'm radical in a lot of things but what comes to the police we always uh, assume that it should be a protection and it should be organized on our uh, behalf on our tax money right and uh, if you go to the New York history actually surprising New York is one of the worst cities in terms of the history of the policing uh, and uh, up till 19th century end of the 19th century police definitely represented the first amendment represented the constitution and represented different uh, categories of people and there was multiple riots multiple uh, upheld and unrest where police usually will not intervene and will not uh, interfere with the public and there was uh, black people who uh, rebelled against the slavery there was an Irish people who rebelled against portraying them as sick and drunken there was uh, there were women who pr uh, protested but in the end of 19th century all of a sudden police function had changed and police had become that institution which represented not the public but the power and the uh, institutional power con uh, concentrated in Tammany Hall and that uh, in that time, it was very powerful lobby group of wealthy white men, mostly. And they created the new tactics how to suppress. And Washington Square Park, which we all know, was a major spot for people to protest. And all of a sudden, police started bullying people. And uh, that changed the co uh, kind of movement of the history in New York City. And when we have the unrest right now, a lot of people do not understand where the defunding police comes from, what does it mean? Actually, it's not the new movement. It started in 1935 with the uh, V.W. Du Bois, the most prominent African-American activist. And uh, at, the, at the time when they, for example, created the Harlem Republic because police was so cruel and brutal and racially profiling. 
And not only African-American people, but queer people who were harassed by the police along the way, just dressing up in different non-binary clothing. So, and the police at that time created the tactic how to suppress. And that comes the, uh, some kind of idea that police does not represent us, police does represent the wealthy people. And what we are observing right now, it's a kind of continuation of that struggle that we've seen throughout the history, uh, not only within the 60s Martin Luther King movement and Black Panther movement and women's movement, but the problem is that police has been created on the basis of the government. And government at that point was very racist. In New York, government was racist as well. New York was kind of an anti-black city for a long time, for a long time, and still we have that division. And when we had that case with George Floyd, absolutely uh, horrible and horrific, and we still talking that it should be equal law and egalitarian law, but uh, supposedly law, law does not work for everyone. The society is still divided, so society still has that institu institutional racism, and police brutality has been proved through different, different, different events. And a defunding police does not mean uh, the original idea of defunding the police does not, uh, does not mean that it should be totally uh, absolve the police, eliminate the police. It was the idea that police has become very heavy and very uh, corrupt institution, which uh, does not perform its uh, primary task to protect citizens. And now when we're talking about defunding police, it means to take and divert money and funds from the police budget to certain under budget uh, services like social services, mental health services, housing services, HIV services, uh, and, and so on and so on and so on. So defunding police has two structural um, ideas. To defund means to cut the budget and to divert the funding. And another more radical idea to abolish police. But abolishing police does not mean to uh, entirely erase the police. It means to reform the police uh, absolutely radically and totally. So it should be disbanded and should be re-reformed again. And the third point is uh, totally uh, disband and abolish police, like abolish, abolish, totally erase the police and do policing from the citizen's point of view, like militia, like militia, right? The uh, people's groups, like we already observed in Brooklyn, some guys like Orthodox Jews on some Russian speaking started organizing mostly in the mob to protect their property from uh, being looted and being uh, breaking through, uh, like in Brighton Beach, Ships at Bay, even no indication of that. And uh, the point of defunding, because since 1960s, when Lyndon Johnson has declared the war on drugs and war on certain crimes, it hit primarily black community because originally idea and preconception about black people were that they're all criminals. And that was Angela Davis' essay on a myth about the black rapists. So all rapes going on only by black people. So that institutional racism was uh, some kind of uh, supported by the government. And after that, uh, in New York, it was um, Fiorella LaGuardia who started the war on prostitution, sex work, and queers. And 60s, it was uh, again the war on crimes. And when we say war on crimes, people mostly meant war on certain groups of people. And there's a lot of architectural structure, Robert Moses who demolished New York and totally segregated and racially profiled New York and pushed uh, certain groups of people to leave. So we see that that's kind of paradigm has been born within the government and government still doing that, unfortunately. And if we say by 2020, for example, the police budget across the country, it's kind of $115 billion in taxpayers, which is enormous. And uh, if we look, for example, at New York City budgets, it's $5.9 billion uh, goes to the police. 80% of that goes to salaries, wages, and overtime. And other, it's like contracts and something like that. And that's a question, especially during the COVID-19, when a lot of funding got cut from different programs like housing and HIV, police does not have that cut. And the question is why we uh, should uh, invest in the police that amount of money rather than to uh, sponsor some vital uh, services which uh, a lot of people depend on. 
And the question about the funding and the debates around that when New York City budget was just give money to the schools, give money to the uh, hospitals, because we are under um, represented in the hospitals. There is no uh, equipment, there is no shortage of people, but we're heavily uh, armed and heavily policed and heavily. Uh, and the question is uh, from the public, why should we invest in the police, right? So, and defunding means just to cut budget and to divert money and to a certain extent, to uh, eliminate certain services the police could not handle. Because if you look, if something goes, goes on uh, in your apartment building, you call the police. If there is mental disturbance, you call the police. Police are not equipped to handle mental health crisis. Police are not equipped to handle domestic disturbance, domestic violence and sex uh, abuse or whatever. So police primary goal is to have some kind of a protection from the criminal activities and if we look actually at this i personally i checked all, all statistics could possibly found and a 2015 data shows us one in three murders never solved so two murders out of three never solved by the police so low track of resolving we don't have and the question is why should we keep that uh, amount of policemen if we cannot solve the certain issues 38 murders, 66% rapes 70% uh, robberies and 47 percent of aggravated assault never sold per year by the police and uh, police and when we go to the race racial profile and institutional races we see that it's inherited as i said during the jim crow era or during some war on crimes and study shows that african americans are 2.7 percent a time more likely to be arrested for drug violations even though the percentage of drug usage between white population and drug, uh, black population the same equally so people consume drugs white and black the same on the same amount on scale the same traffic violation 40 percent of the u.s prisons population is black and we know that it's the new era of slavery then black people put them behind the bars to make cheap labor and we know some judges was uh, indicted because they sold black teens for the some kind of slave owners to have that cheap labor. And the question is why some people, and mostly when we say drug crime, we talk about marijuana possession. Marijuana possession, people get arrested, black people for being uh, carrying some marijuana and put for years uh, behind the bar when white people do not get that sentence. So, and that's a question, uh, does police provide relevant services? Does police have the equality or, or equal view on certain issues? Because we know how the capitalism works in many cases. And what about New York population? 90% of people who stopped by the police of New York, black or Latino or Latinx or Spanish uh, heritage, right? And uh, especially when I already touched upon the mental health crisis. I know I worked as a social worker with people uh, from black communities and who had severe bipolar or schizoaffective disorder or schizoaffective uh, disease. And they sometimes act out and police do not de-escalate them. Police brutally arrest them and put in the facilities. And sometimes they get murdered by the police because they mistaken for acting out. So in that case, people who support defund the police uh, idea say we need to hire and train professional social services, social workers who can handle those calls. If somebody is uh, nervous or disturbed on the street, how many times you pass the New York streets, New York subway, and you see people who talk to themselves, they do not harm you, but you think they're going to harm because it's a preconception about mental health in your mind, which put by the government. So that's the huge issue and that sometimes people get killed just because they had severe episode of bipolar or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. So that's why we are talking about to take those functions and to transfer those functions to professionals, mental health providers, uh, maybe uh, medical staff, social service workers, uh, some kind of child uh, services if it comes to the abuse and whatever. And uh, as I want to conclude that there is another statistic about mental health one in four people killed by the police have severe mental health issues 
have severe, and I remember that case a year ago, two years, guy got shot by the police in Brooklyn for carrying screwdriver and going around, not harming anyone, but police mistook it for the gun. Can you imagine he was just mentally ill and police shot him? He did not provoke them. He was, in that case, should be professional who will de-escalate. And of course, what disturbed me most, um, that uh, very, there is no transparency. So uh, as statistics show, nine out of 10 call for service for non-violent encounters. Nine out of 10, non-violent, non-criminal. And at the same uh, case with, for example, what happened right now, a month ago during the Pride March in New York or during the civil disobedience against the uh, curfew, I still see, I see those pictures, I see those footage and it disturbs me because how can I trust if police provoke sometimes violently and brutally push people aside if they are not uh, harming them, if not, not uh, doing some, it's my perspective, but I've seen different sh footage, right? And I'm uh, more concerned uh, about how we can trust and how we can regain, probably how police can uh, regain the trust if we've seen throughout the decades that people still get and killed, people still get an abuse, and people still treated differently because of color of their skin. And uh, I believe in that and I see that. And to me, it's very uh, unfortunate. And that's why uh, some people will say, but it's somewhere not in New York. But in New York, it happens as well. So, and the idea bad cop and good cop does not work because we are talking not about people. We're talking about, about the institution, which is embodied within the government system, which has been for years very hostile uh, towards a lot of people. And we still see how trans people are uh, treated. Uh, they always will be uh, charged with the soliciting and some uh, sex, sex work uh, more than other people. People. So that's why I'm just trying to uh, provide some statistics which I found throughout national data, throughout the uh, uh, crime reports and whatever. So defunding police, personally, I believe that we have to defund. I was upset with the New York City budget, uh, but I understand there is multiple layers. So I'm just going to hand it back to Yelena and we can uh, afterwards if there is any questions. Lusha, thank you so much. As always, you, 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 you're great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say that we did invite uh, um, elected officials to, uh, to come today, uh, and uh, two of them. And um, I'm a little surprised that they didn't uh, come because elected officials like to be in front of people. But I guess the topic is too hot and they didn't, they, or they didn't have time. But uh, we, we don't have representation here. And it, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna open questions to Lorsha yet. Please hold your questions if you have. I, I wanna go uh, now to Vernon. Uh, Vernon, um, please tell us uh, about your experience, your personal experience, experience of people you know uh, with police and also I definitely uh, do give us uh, your opinion about defunding, abolishing, living as a, as is, uh, and uh, also as an aspect of uh, uh, what you uh, what you experience with Russian speaking uh, people. Um, you you've been with Rusa for for many years, as I said, uh, over six years. You've been uh, amazing to people, uh, and I uh, I was wondering. Uh, if you have a very special experience with uh, uh, Russian LGBT people and Russian speaking people in general, please don't hold back. We, we, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we know that some element of our community is, uh, um, I'm going to say somewhat race, uh, uh, racist, I don't know, if, uh, uh, to the core, but definitely um education is definitely um is 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 missing to some people so please uh, um please tell us about you your experience thanks elena um hopefully everyone can hear me uh, my microphone is a little bit wide range uh i don't think i can add too much more to losha what he said 
Um, a lot of the statistics I read before previously, I didn't know too much about the specific New York history, um, but I can't say I argue with it just from personal experience. Um, I guess from personal experience with police in general, uh, from the time I was able to ride a bike or drive, I've had encounters with uh, the police. I'm originally from Los Angeles, so uh, I'm not um, a New Yorker yet. I moved here and three weeks later I met, uh, or actually two weeks later, I met Yelena and Lib, and then Losha a year later after that. So in California, here's some experiences I've had that definitely I can understand when people say the community doesn't trust the police, African-American community. Um, there are things that have happened in my life that had no provocation at all. I just happened to be black in the wrong place. I grew up in a town in LA that was, you know, a suburb, West Hills, Woodland Hills, primarily uh, white. So, you know, I, I wasn't born with a silver spoon. My parents worked to be in that neighborhood and could afford to be there. Uh, however, my father, born Jamaica, born in Jamaica, always instilled in me as my grandfather that, and pardon what I'm about to say is, it doesn't matter who you are or what you do or how, success how successful you are, to them, you're always a nigga. That was my grandfather and that was my father. Two separate conversations, years apart, same thing. And me ignoring that, thinking this is not Jim Crow, this isn't my grandfather's era and things are different now and I have mixed group of friends, um, they're crazy. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, I have been, I have fit so many descriptions. At one point, I wasn't sure who I was. I was driving home once, or driving to work, sorry, that's a different one. There's many. If you want to hear more, we can all meet some other time. But uh, I was driving to work one morning. I just got in the car that weekend. It was a Honda Civic. 19, uh, 1997, 1998. And I was going to work at that time. I worked as a clerk in a law firm. And I got pulled over on the way to work, wearing a shirt kind of like this with a tie. And when I asked them what the problem was, they simply asked me to get out of the car, spun me around, put on handcuffs, slammed me against the wall on the side of this uh, grocery store, and proceeded to search my car and ignored every time I asked, what's the problem? His partner stood next to me while the other guy tossed the car. Finally, the partner asked me, so what do you do for work? As if this is a casual conversation and this is 30 minutes into my morning, uh, I said, I work at a law firm. Attitude changed. They understood what they were doing was BS. He calls over to his buddy and walks over to him and immediately they became, they said, oh, sorry, we thought your car was stolen because it only has paper plates. A car was driven off the Honda lot last night or this weekend and we're trying to track them down. And I looked at them like, are you serious? I'm gonna drive down the street in a shirt and tie on my way to work in a stolen car. You assumed it was stolen, you couldn't check the VIN or the paper that was stuck inside the windshield and verify that the car was purchased on Saturday? That was one incident. There was another even more horrific. I was driving home at the time I had a, a girl in the car down Malibu Canyon and we were pulled over. Car walks up to the car, a uh, cop walks up to the car, says, can I see your license identification? Sure, I asked him what's going on. He said, wait a second, went back to his car, came back, asked me to step out, slammed me on the car door, on the hood, handcuffed me, put me in the back of his patrol car. I think Officer Locke knows what the police cars look like with the floodlights on the sides. Mm -hmm. Took the one on the driver's side and faced it towards me. So I couldn't see, he blinded me, I couldn't see what was going on. I can see the far right end of the back of the car. He proceeds to toss the car to look for something, any guns, weapons, who knows what he's looking for. He finds nothing. He finds a BB gun in the trunk that was there for God knows how long. 
and a little folding pocket knife in the center console. So after he's done searching, he finds nothing. He issues me a ticket for window tint and says, have a nice day and walks away. I'm fuming, I'm pissed off. I don't know what this is for. The girl on the, on the other hand is in tears crying. Do you know what the officer asked her? He asked her if she was with me of her own will. Absent of anything else he could find in that car, he decided to find out if I had kidnapped the beautiful blonde girl who was sitting next to me. The distrust in the police doesn't come from nowhere. As Losha pointed out, not only is it systematic, it is ingrained so much that African Americans as a community for a long time have accepted it as this is the way it is. Because no matter what we say, no matter how we protest, whether we kneel, whether we write letters, whether we march, whether we go to community meetings with police officers, nothing changes. So I, I, I argue with those who claim the system is broken. Uh, you know, not a vicious argument. I ask them in what ways is it broken? Because from my perspective, it isn't broken. It's working exactly as it was intended to do. Why else would it not be fixed? When you break, when something's broken, we fix it. Even in this country, in this current political climate, where you know, obviously the man in the White House is is severely racist. If he claims not to be, he surrounds himself with them. So he's not going to do anything to change these things. But America before this guy wasn't perfect, but you can always count on it at some point, not tomorrow, to fix its mistakes. So why is this one still here? Because it's working how it's supposed to be. It's supplied, you know, Reagan and politicians, for example, who had the war on drugs and war on crime, which meant essentially war on those communities. Because you put enough of them in the cells, you get enough numbers, you get enough reports saying you're doing something when actually, you know, you're, you're not. As Losha pointed out, and I've made the comment to a friend of mine, a Russian friend of mine, I said, if me and you were to go walk around with two bags of weed in our pockets on two different sides of the city, one of us is going home with a warning. The other one of us, well, one of three options, either we're getting beat up, we're going to jail, or we're getting a ticket or whatever. We're getting something. We're not getting away free. So while I don't agree about abolish the police, I do see there is a need for policing. I can't honestly, despite all I've been through, advocate for just dismantling it and being done. <clears throat> I also don't see any value in a solely community policing. I think police are necessary. I don't think they can solve health issues. Nope, they can't solve mental health issues. They definitely cannot address a domestic violence thing because usually they're here after the fact. As an example, I've had three shootings on my block, two of them in the last uh, three weeks. All together, I've lived here one year. There's been four or five shootings, all stemming from this block. Big party area, don't know why. Um, how, many, how many they've solved? Well, I talked to two officers after the last one, which was next door. And uh, they said they had zero leads on the one before that. And they don't expect to have any on the one, this one, even though we have cameras in the front of our building. They're not gonna solve everything. The community though, I know people on this block know who exactly who did it, but they don't trust the police enough to tell them. There's people in front of my building that are here all the time that know the people who were shot. I know they know them. I don't know them. Wish I did. I could have told the cops everything, but they don't because they don't trust what the officers are going to do to them or to people who may be their friends, whatever they might have done. It's crazy. I know. That is probably something far beyond my pay grade to, to deal with. But as many times as I've called the 77th, which is over here in Crown Heights, to take part in community outreach meetings to discuss the issues with this neighborhood, whatever it is, I've called four times. I've gotten zero calls back. Officer, I can't remember his name, so he gave me his card after the last shooting. He's actually called me back. He's, he's actually a good guy. 
can't say all cops are bad. I can say they really need to fix their system. First, if we're gonna defund anything, defund that defense fund, period. Remove it, done. I think that would correct a lot of bad apples who join the police just to be bad apples with a gun, but good officers will never have an issue, shouldn't have an issue, shouldn't complain about it either. But the bad ones, once something happens, they immediately face the same charges that any of us would. Any of us who were accused of a crime, why is it that it is so rare you can probably put the handful of officers who've ever been convicted of anything in the Smithsonian so we can watch them and look at them another 50 years from now and say, that four guys, those four officers were convicted of crimes. How rare is that? That's crazy. We should allow good cops to be good cops, bad cops to take the same way out that bad people do. Change directions here in terms of uh, something a little bit more personal. Um, dealing with the Russian speaking community. Uh, as uh, Losha knows, I've spoken to him several times. I walked away from it. I've distanced myself over the last couple of years uh, because I thought I'd found a community that understood me. Uh, I am black and gay, and I didn't come out and fully accept myself until I came to New York. I couldn't in California. Family, friends, it's a little bit more difficult now. It's a different story. But I decided when I landed here, touched down here, I was no longer going to hide who I was. Just before I left, I had an organization that was educating in HIV and AIDS information. I created my own nonprofit to do this. We decided to get into <coughs> issues. That's when I reached out to Rusa while I was still in California to get information to find out what I could do because I felt pouring out vodka on sidewalks, which is what people were doing, was mindless and didn't make any sense. I, I that was just dumb. So I felt I needed to do something. I ended up moving, and I ended up meeting these guys and and. Uh, made great friends, memorable friends. And I thought I found at least an area where people saw me as me. That was proven wrong abruptly. Uh, in one fashion, uh, a mutual friend of mine for this person who shall not be named, uh, had been arguing on Facebook with this person's boyfriend about his anti-immigrant and anti-racist comments. So this friend of mine took it upon himself to tell friend B to stop arguing with my boyfriend, leave him alone, blah, 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 blah. When friend B decided to point out that your boyfriend is extremely racist and hateful, his response was, I don't care. I fucking hate black people. He sent me a screenshot. My friend B sent me a screenshot of this. This is someone I spent three or four days a week with, going to bars, going to lunches, going to dinners, consoled when he and his boyfriend broke up, uh, try to help him through that depression, whatever it is. And we were close. I was crushed when I read that. I had no idea I would find that here in a group of people who were treated as exiles in their own lands came here to this country to be free and be who they are and not be judged. Yet the, these particular people or the, a group of them have decided it's okay to be racist and anti against people simply because of the color of their skin. Shot. And how I know and came to know is pervasive is the rumors I started to hear, completely imaginary, of course, but you don't make up something to break someone's reputation, to uh, smear them, to hurt them, insult them, all, all behind their backs, unless you have some underlying dislike or hate for them. I could be wrong, but I don't personally come up with reasons or stories to talk about anybody that I've never met, never spoken to, and never spent any time with, unless I just have some distinct dislike for it. Like, 
I can tell you, I don't like peanut butter. I can tell you all the ways how it sucks. I've had one spoonful of peanut butter in my life back when I was a kid, and I just hate it. Never even tried any of the new brands or whatever it is. I just don't like it. I don't like cauliflower. I don't even like the way it looks. I can tell you, I dislike it. Same thing works with people. If someone's going to say something hateful about you, don't even know you and never met you, they can just look at you and decide to say things. That comes from somewhere. And as the people who would hear these conversations when I wasn't in the room would come to tell me about them, I learned that this, it was beyond the one person I thought, the one close friend I, I thought I had and his boyfriend. It was beyond the couple of people I had heard rumors about. It was something that is really here in the Russian speaking community. And it hurt. I poured time. I spent time learning the history of the country. I've traveled the country. I've gone back and forth with Losha about uh, historical points that I wasn't sure about or unsure of and questioned. I uh, hosted eight of Russian speakers in my own home at my own expense and saw to it they found a good lawyer. Personally walked the streets of Brooklyn in and out of restaurants to get a manager to agree to hire people. And I've gone to find their attorneys. And all I ever asked for them to do in return is to do the same thing for someone else. To do that and to have some people uh, decide to disparage my name or call me whatever in the background or say things was, was hurtful, honestly. I, I didn't dwell on it too long. I just immediately just said, okay, I'm done and walked away. But I think the community itself needs a historical understanding provided by Losha, but a continual understanding by all means. Even those who decided to say disparaging and horrible things about me, reach out, message me, ask me a question. I'm, I'm open to discuss. Don't get nasty because I'll just block you and remove you. But, 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 but definitely, historically or whatever, or how I'm feeling or what I'm thinking about, some friends have, especially during the Floyd riots, which kind of brought a lot of things to the surface that I thought I had left behind. Um, just watching the video broke my heart entirely. I got teary eyed just watching. I couldn't look at it. I can't look at it now anymore. Same with um, the gentleman who was stomped after he was already shot in the parking lot, just falling, just sleeping off whatever he'd been drinking, sleeping off in his car, minding his own business. He gets shot. That's hatred. The guy was already on the ground, and the officer decided to stomp him. So, uh, I'm hoping moving forward, um, we can address this more routinely and regularly. Uh, I understand there's a lack of understanding of the history here. There's a lack of trust with the, uh, the police here as well, considering what's going on, or some absolutely trust the police, which is fine. But if you want to see, understand what is happening here, why Black Lives Movement is a thing, why it's become so great, there's a couple of reasons, there's many reasons, but one is a historical precedence, precedence that if you're newly arrived here in the last handful of years, you can't possibly comprehend watching Channel One or Fox TV who are politically skewed in one direction. Go Google, Google your information, go find it. It's there, it's right there. There's no excuse for not understanding what's happening in America, in your town, and in your police department. You can actually, there are some actually there at the department. You can wander in, I did. You can walk in there and ask to speak to an officer and they will actually sit and chat with you about what's going on. There's absolutely no excuse for ignorance or racism when in particular, you're yourself fighting to be heard, recognized and it's valued and accepted for who you are. And with that, I'll give it back to Lynn. Vernon, thank you so much for opening up to us. And uh, all I can say is I'm, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry um, that, uh, that it happened. Uh, and it happened from Russian speaking LGBT community that 
is really, in fact, very grateful to you. People here appreciate you. Not everyone <coughs> is racist. Don't please don't think so. I know you don't. Uh, um, all, all I can say is that um, Russian-speaking uh, LGBT people um, are every everything. Just just they're good people. That bad people. They're uh, uh, the only that separates what separates them is uh, uh, their uh, 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 orientation, which doesn't make them good or bad. They're they're everything, and they're a product of their upbringing. And and what we try to do here in Rusa is uh, uh, help those people who can't come recently or even even before um, understand this country, understand dynamics in this country, and understand laws in this country, not only to come and, and, and take advantage of something that uh, that is given to them because of uh, a good heart of this country, but also see other people struggle. And uh, and this event today is just the first one. We, we actually um, planning on series of events that will be talking uh, about hard topics uh, like racism. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and, and what does it mean for this country? Obviously, it's not one panel discussion. There will be many, many different conversations, including uh, the war on drugs and uh, uh, anti-immigrant laws and, and how it all works together against people. And uh, um, I, I hope you will join us then as well, because your, your, your point is very valuable to us. Please understand. We did not have the same experience. So some people need education and uh, th there's no excuse for ignorance. Um, and we, we will try to, uh, to help as much as possible. And thank you again so much for, uh, for being there for people who needed you and for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Well, that was hard to hear. Uh, and, uh, uh, Okay, well, we'll, we'll try to uh, move on from that. Uh, not move on from that, but uh, um, uh, go to our next uh, uh, guest. And I, I, I would like, uh, Carl, for you to, uh, um, to help us understand what, are your, what is your opinion about uh, um, um, reform uh, uh, or all those other words, abolish, w w where do you stand on this? Um, what is your point? Uh, also, please, uh, if you can, address uh, um, accusations in police br brutality. And, uh, uh, and, and, and my personal, uh, I feel like it's very, very interesting how union, police union, what role police union is playing in, uh, uh, in what is happening. Um, yeah, I will try. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, Vernon, you know, uh, thank you for being so vulnerable. I think it's important for people to hear uh, each other's stories and be willing to share them. So I'm not uh, liking following you. And Loisha, thank you for the history. Uh, I do want to say, um, you know, I, I didn't really know what the topic was going to be this morning, and I didn't really, I knew roughly, and I didn't know how the format was going to be, so I don't have a full presentation made. I'm really going to speak a little spontaneously based on some of the information I've been given, but um, what I what I do want to, I guess, say first is that what happened in Minneapolis and with George Floyd was... Um, a terrible thing to watch, terrible thing as a human being, terrible thing as a police officer. Um, it's haunting. I only watched it twice. I couldn't watch it more than that. Um, and I'm proud to hear that there are a lot of police officers who have said and felt the same thing, that uh, what we saw was not an example of policing or good policing. Um, you know, it was terrible. So I wanted to start with saying that. The second thing I want to say is I am now in my 19th year of the police department. I never thought I would have been part of the NYPD for 19 years. Um, and I'm saying that because 
you know, I, when I came to New York, I came to New York to escape a really small town in, in Virginia. And I had no idea how I could be myself there. I came here and uh, was able to accept myself and come out and be gay. And I did that during the HIV epidemic. And I realized my gay self during that, that crisis. And I dedicated a lot of my professional life to HIV work. And uh, I got my master's degree and I did social work. And my last job as a social worker was really at the Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project as a crime victim advocate. I was the, actually the director of clinical services and I oversaw the same sex domestic violence, the bias, the hate crime, even a police misconduct program. So in my mind, I saw myself as a, as a, as a gay activist. I had been to protests and rallies and um, being a police officer was the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> um, but doing that work, I ended up interacting with people from the Gay Officers Action League, and um, I was introduced to different precincts to help. When there was a crime in the gay community, they reached out to work with us, or we brought stuff to them because we wanted justice for our community and for that victim. And um, long story short, it was my personal decision. I know it's not the decision most people make, but. I remember being at a rally for Peter Garcia, who was a Latino man who um, during Memorial Day weekend was found murdered in an SRO in Chelsea. And it turns out he had met somebody at the limelight and, and went, took him back to the room he had rented and he was stabbed to death. And that was just one of many cases that we monitored. Uh, but that case and the Fitzroy Green case were cases that stuck with me. And I felt like the police department maybe just didn't care enough to get the work done. And I was tired of standing outside on the street, rallying and protesting, because a week later, a lot of times people didn't remember we were there. I didn't feel like it changed much. So for me, you know, as an activist, and for me, as someone who knew some of the cops and knew some of the work that was being done when it worked, it worked well, and when it didn't work, it, didn't, it was terrible. I made the decision that I was going to put my money where my mouth was. You know, if I wanted that system to change and I felt I was an agent to change, I was gonna go inside that system, right? And I was gonna see, could I make any difference? Could I change it? Um, I thought I might just graduate the academy or maybe do a couple of years. Um, but for me, it was a form of activism. I and mean, even now, 19 years later, coming to work and whether I put on my uniform or my suit and I represent the department, and I go into meetings and I'm advocating and pushing for policy and change. I feel like I'm an agent of change and I do feel like I've seen this department change. So I think the NYPD you had in the 20s and the 40s and some of the things that we heard from Loisha and especially from the 50s and 60s and 70s to what it was even in the 80s and 90s and in the 2000s, there's a very different police department here in New York City today. Um, me as an officer, it's sometimes frustrating when people go back and forth between talking about like the NYPD and the NYPD does this or does this, but oh, all poli police in general, police do this, look at the statistics for police and how terrible they, oh, but then they come back to the NYPD. And uh, I think it's really helpful to talk about policing in general sometimes. I think it's also very helpful to look specifically what's going on in your local community and see has there been progress and change. And it's my perspective there has, I think there should always be. So I know you asked me what um, did I think about all these terms, defund the police, abolish the police. Um, you know, I was out there at all these rallies and protests right before it happened and COVID was here. I was going to the morgues and to the hospitals. And so I've been here during the epidemic and I've been here during the, the recent protests and Black Lives Matter movement. Um, those things don't bother me. They don't bother um, the people that I work with. Um, I've worked a lot of different protests. Um, I think First Amendment rights are important. I think change comes from that. I don't know if everyone means the same thing when they say defund the police, but Loisha covered that. I don't want to repeat it. Uh, for me, I think what it means more is the reallocation of the funds and not really abolishing or, or um, recreating. Um, I do think that our police department, the NYPD, does a lot of things really well. I think we need to keep challenging ourselves to do better. Um, I think if you look at what Congress passed recently in terms of the police reforms, almost everything on those lists are things that the NYPD has already done. Um, even some of the more recent changes and going backwards, you know, we have the body cameras now, the chokeholds are not available, there's been more um, transparency, um, there are officers who are held accountable, uh, there are people who are arrested for crimes and terminated and lose their jobs, and um, I think we've come a long way, and the police force now, I think, is 49 or 48 percent white, and the rest are people of color, so this department, um, has come a long way. And I think that there's enough people here willing to make it change. 
so that those words about defund or um, police reform, I wel- I personally, I welcome them. All right, so I know you asked me two more things. Now, gay pride, Loisha talked about. You know, I don't consider this year what happened, you know, you know, it wasn't the typical gay pride. There was not the heritage of pride rallies and, and march. This was really the, 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 the activist group. Uh, everyone else that wanted to, to have their permits, they were not allowed to, to celebrate pride the way that they wanted to. All the, the public gatherings were canceled. But Reclaim Pride and the Queer Liberation uh, wanted to focus on Black Lives Matters and put their stuff out there. And so I was there. I attended the rally from the beginning. I walked with people to the end. For the most part, it was very peaceful. Um, I was standing right there at the arch where the stuff eventually jumped off uh, and everything was going well. Uh, after I walked away, like five minutes later, things exploded. But uh, I was just a minute away. I'd walked into the park to see what things were going on inside. So by the time I got back out, you know, it had already exploded. Everybody was standing in the street. There were bottles being thrown. People were screaming. Um, it was a little chaotic. Uh, people were sitting by a van trying to stop the van. They thought there were people arrested in the van. I looked in the van. I told them there weren't. They didn't believe me. I got permission to show them in the van. I was like, you know, my job was to try to de-escalate and help the situation calm down at that point. But I was able to look at some video, not just that was put online. Um, I did some of that in some of the police body cam. And I, I will tell you from my experience, a peaceful protest, if you see officers make an arrest, usually what you do in a peaceful protest is you'll stop, you'll point, right? You start chanting shame, shame, shame. You try to get pictures, badge numbers. You know, that's what you do if you see something going on in a peaceful protest that you don't like. That's not what I saw at this thing. What I saw at this thing is protesters didn't think the officers should be making an arrest. They charged them. Uh, they hit them. They tried to free the prisoner uh, that was in custody in handcuffs. Um, they ripped off body cameras and they surrounded the cops. They wouldn't let other cops come in. And that's okay. You, you know, you're out there and at a protest, you have the decision to make. Are, am I going to be peaceful? Am I going to be non-peaceful? Am I going to be violent? Am I going to, you know, there's, it's your decision. But it was hard for me to hear a lot of people saying afterwards, the, the police charged us violently on Pride. When I, I was there and I saw what happened, and really the, the crowd charged the police because they didn't like their action. And there is, a, there is a difference. And I think just, you know, let's call it what it is. In terms of the unions, I'm not an expert on the unions. I belong to the union. Um, you know, I know that we have more than one union here in New York. So. You have unions for the civilians, but you have unions for uh, police officers, then for detectives, then for sergeants, lieutenants, and captains. So there's several different unions. Um, I, I'm really not an expert in them. I know that union jobs are supposed to be really to look out for their members and advocate for their members and do the best they can. So I'm more than happy to look more into it and get more information about the politics of the unions and the city council, but I'm just not an expert on that right now. So uh, I think I just want to end my time now to have other people speak and ask questions. And thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Um, I I am sure people have questions right now. I know Lebre is receiving uh, written questions. I, I myself have uh, uh, certain questions for you as well, uh, Carl. Um, we, we did talk about uh, uh, being as civil as possible, and we will, but we do have some tough questions for you you knew it, they will be coming um just sure. give me give me a, a, a give us a few minutes i think that uh, um what i would like to do i would like to make sure that uh that we have all our guests uh, uh speaking and then we'll open up for questions um in in a moment um uh, i do want to ask uh, um um anatoly how are you doing with translation do you need a break no, you good? Okay, okay. Uh, it is very tough to simultaneously translate for over an hour, and it's probably it's going to be probably more like two hours. I I I, uh, I don't know how you do it. Thank you so much for being here and helping us. So our next guest is Sasha uh, Raskinian. Hi, Sasha. Um, I just want to say a few words uh, about Sasha and uh, her her work. So. Um, uh, Sa- as I said, Sasha was uh, uh, the first in her family born in the U- U.S. after her family immigrated in the uh, 1970s from former Soviet Union. 
she came out as bi in her late teens and started looking for a more welcoming community, getting involved in activism, and eventually finding her political home in Juice for Racial and Economic Justice, where she helped start campaign for police accountability. Uh, I would uh, like her to please go ahead uh, and, and, and tell us uh, more about your work and more more about work of your organization, Sasha. And, and thank you for being so patient with us. You need to unmute yourself before you talk. Yep. Thank you so much. And as you can tell by my propensity to smile, I was definitely born here. Don't judge me too hard for it. It's I can't help but do it as an American. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It's it's incredible to hear everyone who has gone before me. Um, a lot of my points are related to what Yosha said and Vernon. It's in, incredible to hear your story. Um, and Carl, thank you for mentioning the specificity of language. I will be talking primarily, I've done my activist work here in New York exclusively, but throughout I'll be talking about policing in general um, as a system. And I'll talk a bit about what that means at the end. Um, I wanted to start by saying that as an activist, right, there are, as, as everyone has said, defund the police means lots of different things to lots of different people. And it's sort of the thing that has caught on right now but it is related to calls that people have been making for a long time in less catchy, but pretty much the same ways. Things like, we deserve education, we need good housing, we need mental health services, right? Which to me is actually synonymous with defund the police. And defund the police happens to be the thing that caught on, which is why I'm so glad we're having this panel because it's harder to understand. Um, so I wanna start by saying that for me, defund the police really um, asks, is about asking the question, what makes us safe? And asks that we fund that. Um, so I wanna start with a few facts really around um, LGBTQ community and violence. Um, a lot of which I got from the National Co Coalition for Anti-Violence Projects where Carl used to be involved. Um, so 48% of LGBTQ victims of violence reportedly experienced police misconduct when um, encountering with the police after they were victims of a crime. Nearly half of transgender uh, folks said they feel uncomfortable seeking police assistance. 9% of LGBTQ homicides nationally were related to police violence. I believe that was in 2017. Um, and as many as 300,000 crimes against LGBTQ people are not reported for many reasons but one of, one of them is the risk of police violence. And as Vernon talked about, that is especially true among black and brown LGBTQ people. Um, so the question of what makes us safe and how is policing related to that is a very important question, right? Because if crimes are not being reported, if people who experience crimes don't feel comfortable going to the police, um, first of all, that means that even, even violent crimes are not always being addressed. And it doesn't actually address the underlying reason for why we may not feel safe. Um, like Lyosha said, defund the police is not an immediate request um, by pretty much anyone except for the most sort of radical of activists. There's definitely people who say abolish the police right now. Um, but for the most part, um, it is a call to um, work on funding those institutions that actually create long-term safety. And that includes things like schools, like healthcare, good jobs, decent immigration services, supporting parents, um, counseling, a lot of the things that actually help people build the lives that they want in the first place um, in communities that feel safe. So, the other thing that's tough about this idea of defund the police is it's hard to envision it, right? It's hard to, what does that look like? Um, and something that I heard that was really incredible is that what defunding the police looks like is what predominantly white suburbs actually tend to look like for their white residents. Relatively little interaction with police, excellent schools, good housing, decent jobs, good education, um, counseling and rehabilitation services, an assumption that if your kid or family member um, is using drugs or does something wrong, they deserve a future and we can fight for that, right? We can send them to rehab, we can figure out what kind of supports they need. It's, it's fundamentally believing that our people deserve a future, right? And so I think that is where this is related in a lot of ways to racism because it matters 
who we think of as our people. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so ultimately, um, it's exactly what Yosha was saying, right? That we, we look at who can actually provide these social services and fund them, funding schools, funding social workers, funding housing for people who need housing, um, and making sure that those are the people who are available and are easy to call when those services are needed, right? We all know 911. It's an incredible service. What if there was something like that that made it possible for people to access other services, right? I remember when 311 started in New York and it was incredible because all of a sudden there was somewhere else to call. Um, but even that like doesn't replace, it's harder to figure out how do I get somebody to respond to something. And you don't always know if you call for a mental health crisis, who will show up? Will it be the police? Will it be an ambulance? What will it be, right? So people hesitate to call anyways because they're not sure where the response will be. Um, okay, so I do want to talk a bit about like what, what the other piece of defund the police that often gets talked about is systemic racism. So I just like want to define that because I think we throw around a lot of terms without ever explaining what they are. I think um, the progressive movement has a, bit, has a bit of trouble communicating to people who aren't already in the movement and that breaks my heart <laughs> because it's not, I don't think it's enough to say like, it's just that everyone's racist, it's just that the system is broken, right? Because what does that mean? So for me, I think about systemic uh, racism and this actually all, when we say like systemic anything, systemic oppression, systemic whatever, including against LGBTQ people, um, I think about it in something called the four I's, like I as in immigrant, um, and that it, it means that everything functions on, on those levels. So let me, I'll do this with like LGBTQ things, because I think that's like the shared experience we have here. The first is that like we experience oppression as an ideological thing, right, as an idea that it is better to be straight that it is that we are somehow wrong or that, that this is what we're told by society, right? That there's something wrong with us for being gay, that there's that we should just try to be this other way, that this is what's normal. There's a certain thing that's normal and everyone else is not normal, is not bad. We just, and even when it's like we accept gay people, it's like they're the sort of exception, right? And so even when it's, when people are not opposed to, to LGBTQ people, there's still this idea that there's like a normal and that normal is straight, right? And we have to fit into that. There's also the institutional, which is how institutions like the police, like schools, um, like laws manifest, like create, uh, take these ideas and turn them into laws, schooling, education, reality, whatever, right? So, and that's, when the call says that like, it's not about individual bad apples, it's because it's not about police as individuals. It's about the institution of policing, which um, is functioning under an ideology that is ultimately racist, right? And then you get to interpersonal. And this is the one we recognize, right? This is when people use racial slurs or say something bad, um, use homophobic language, uh, hit someone, punch someone, right? That's the one we tend to recognize. But for me, that is a manifestation of all these other things. And it is, it's important, it matters. It's like how we experience like the people we care about and the people we come into contact with. But when we're talking about how that, what that matters around policing, like it's the bad cops sort of thing. But even with only good cops, you still have the ideology, right? You still have that there. Um, and the last I is internalized. And that's how we um, experience these things ourselves. That's how we learn them, both as people who are oppressed and as people who are not, that we, we just internalize this idea that like it is normal to be straight, right? How much did all of us struggle to come out if that was your experience? How painful was that, right? Because we had internalized that there was something wrong about us. Um, and that is true with racism too, right? We internalize no matter what race we are, either the normal superiority, right, of white people um, or an ideology that says that black people are inferior, right? And that is something that we all have to fight against both as white people and um, my son is a, a person of color, like that is something that he will have to struggle with, right, as he comes up. Um, so I just, I just wanted to go through that because I think it's really helpful to sort of take this away. Like the question to me isn't, are you racist? Like that matters, but ultimately that isn't the, like, getting rid of all racists doesn't change the ideology, right? And, and that's why their institutional change, the defund the police really matters because the institution is relevant. Um, okay, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. It's probably time for questions.
Wonderful. Sasha, thank you so much. Thank you. And when you said that I, as an immigrant, I was like, oh my God, I have this t-shirt. I can support this t-shirt today. So here we are. Uh, but seriously, uh, amazing. Thank you very much. I think every one of our guests today uh, can can have an hour for themselves and explain to us uh, their points, and maybe and maybe we will uh, uh, we will do something like this in the future. Uh, definitely interesting uh, uh, points of view. Um, I wanted to uh, before we open up the audience. Uh, I I I I believe we 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 are getting. Um, as I was expecting, um, questions and some some statements. Um, I'm gonna. I, I guess I'm gonna start us off. Um, uh, and a question uh, I have is uh, to Carl. Carl, I, I felt like you uh, you definitely presented your point uh, 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 as a as a gay man uh, being in LGBT uh, being in in police. Um, but I, I felt like you you just uh, did it a little bit of a soft uh, a soft touch here. And, uh, and yes, uh, uh, a lot of what, uh, just about everything you said is true. And, and I'm sure you, you, you were trying to assist to deescalate uh, the situation. Um, but not everybody did that. And a lot of people didn't do it. And Thank God we have cameras everywhere right now, and there are videos flying around, not only on uh, Facebook, but New York Times had, uh, I want to say, about 20 videos of, of, you cannot call it anything else but police brutality. Um, and if you do not disclose from, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I apologize, I don't remember the name of this uh, um, statue when when police does not have to uh, disclose information uh, about internal investigations of policemen. So basically, the bad policemen can never be revealed, and 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 um, uh, and there is a blue wall. Um, how do you what do you what do you say to that? How, how do you feel about that? Is 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 it real, or you think it's? Uh, every one of those videos could be explained? No, I mean, I saw some of the New York Times. I didn't watch every video. Um, I've seen my own videos just from the, um, the 28th on Gay Pride. There was a video of uh, a female on a bike behind a van and an officer reaches back and pushes her off, right? So I saw that, I saw the same event. There's a picture of people uh, pepper spraying. So, um, I, I didn't, and I won't go through all the things in the Times because unless I'm there, it's difficult. But what I will say is I've seen, and so has the department and people are being investigated. If an officer does something wrong, they should have be held accountable for it. There's no excuse for us, you know? Yeah, it's difficult to be there. Yeah, it's difficult to have people surround you because you feel threatened, right? It's difficult to have people um, call you a pig and I smell baking and burn and you're, you're a terrible person, quit your job, what are you doing? Don't you have a conscience, you know? And, you know, but, but it's our job. We, I, we understand that people are angry and we understand that people get upset and we have to be able to, to tune that out and, and do our job, which is to allow that it's your right to express your feelings and your anger outside. So if somebody loses their temper, loses their control while they're working in uniform and does something inappropriate, they should absolutely be held accountable for it. And they are. I know those investigations are underway. The second part was about the, the law in New York. And I forget that acronym 250-A something. Um, I think what the police department and the union's problem with that was it wasn't necessarily, it was about disciplinary records in the police department and making them public. And I think the issue wasn't, you know, if somebody has been proven, if they went through a, a due process and it was found that they did something wrong or they were found guilty, that most people don't really have think, a problem, I think, letting that information be out. But the problem is, let's say an allegation is made against me and they couldn't prove it. Or they'd say there's no, not enough evidence one way or the other, so it's kind of unsubstantiated. Or, you know, I'm completely vindicted and it was wrong. There's video that shows it was made up story. Um, people feel like some of that information probably shouldn't get out because why should something that's not true about me get out in my record as if it could be true? So I think it was what kind of information should get out. 
in the disciplinary records was was some of our concern. Thank you. Uh, and, um, we okay. have a question from Jenny, and I'm going to mute her for this question. Oh, I just want, um, my name's Jeannie. Um, I'm actually a civilian who works in the police department and I'm Jewish and I'm of Russian descent, although American and I'm a lesbian. Um, you definitely belong, Jeannie. Carl, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, looks like you're on the 14th or 13th floor. I'm here on the eighth floor of police headquarters. Um, I just want to say that that law they changed. So they did like just change like they did just change that law with the police accountability uh, police files. So I think. But it's changed. very recent. It is very yeah. recent. Yeah. Well, that's the whole thing is that um, you know there's many layers to this and there's history and there's you know um, like um, Vernon I think was talking about L A. And I recently saw a doc, I forget what it was, but like, like LA Police Department, its history of racism is extreme. Like, you know, like nothing I would have ever imagined. I'm not, not to say there's no, been no racism here in New York. I mean, we have, we ha what I was discussing with you, we were discussing this, like, you know, government institutions are racist. I've worked for the police department for five years. I have 20 years in government. Most of those years were in human services, working in child welfare. That's a very racist system. When I joined child welfare in 1995, 50,000 kids were in foster care. Most of them kids of color. Most of them removed for, them, for their homes just because they were black and poor. Um, a lot of reforms were put in place for the years I worked there. Now there's only like 10 or 15,000 kids in foster care. Um, uh, um, you know, the schools, like all of my friends who all of a sudden were complaining about the police in our recent protests, like they go out of their way to make sure their kids get uh, admitted into the elite public schools in New York City, that most black kids don't really have the means or the familial, you know, know-how to get into. So our, our public school system is segregated. Um, so there are a lot of problems. Um, and, you know, police officers, and I, I myself, like Carl, I wouldn't have called myself an activist, but, you know, in my youth, I was arrested twice in protests. And uh, when the police department wound up hiring me, I was like, oh, well, when they find out I've been arrested, you know, they're not going to want to hire me. But that wasn't true. Uh, they hired me even though I've been arrested as an activist. Uh, and, you know, I had my stereotypes about the police department. I thought they were going to be all straight white guys. Um, who are Republicans who lived on Long Island. And, um, you know, the point is a good one that every police department is a locality. So when you do use these national statistics about the police, you know, you can't compare NYPD, which is, has majority minority cops. So white men are, are now in the minority and it's 50% female. Um, you can't really compare, you can't really compare that to like, you know, uh, what happened in um, with George Floyd or what's happening in different police departments in the South. New York Police Department is, you know, considered the best, best police department in the world. So I'm kind of proud to work at a place like that. And, um, you know, like stop and frisk was a racist policy and that was changed and they realized it. Like Carl also said, you know, you got to look at like you know, what was going on in 1980s, 1990s, early 2000s. Now, now we're in a different era. And, you know, also because of the protests and what happened, change is coming a little more accelerating. Um, but just to say, you know, I had, I had my stereotypes and fears about police. And I'm a white woman speaking with white women pri pri privilege. I have to say that. But, um, you know, I've learned a lot in the five years I've been here as a civilian and, um, and I find, you know, everyone I, I deal with very professional, very knowledgeable, very well trained. Um, no, I don't think anyone seeks to to harm anyone. Um, there are the officers who, you know, who have problems, and and you know, they've just in the last couple of weeks, as a result of the recent unrest, are trying to streamline and you know do a better job of of holding those who can't 
you know, uphold, you know, what they swear to do accountable. Um, Jeannie, thank you very much. I, I guess you don't have a specific question, but I do want to say that uh, it is a very good point that uh, the the structure of this country is racist. There's everything around us, and, and, and that most of us here on this call are white, and most of us are, are foreigners, basically immigrants. We, we don't have this experience. And I believe some uh, a, a lot of white people who are born in white neighborhoods also don't have this experience. They don't see institutions as, as racial because, because they don't experience the, the being not privileged. And I think this is, a, 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 this is the core that, uh, that many, many things, institutions, language is racist and we don't even know that. We, we just accept it as, as, as a norm. And, uh, and if anything can change in that, it's like we have to start educating ourselves. And this uh, event is actually part of that education uh, for people, uh, hopefully, we all find out something new, found out something new, and, and we'll, we'll be willing to, to, to learn more. Uh, and, it, and it is a true statement. Uh, and I thank you very much for your comment, Ginny. Um, uh, that uh, that m not only police are, is racist, that's for sure. But police is the one that has batons. And police is the one that comes after underprivileged people and protects the, uh, the power. And, 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 and that's where the clashes actually happen. So they basically are on the front line of everything because they, they, they have a, 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 a bigger responsibility than others. And, and they represent racism. Uh, maybe more than others in this way. And that's uh, obviously my opinion. Uh, Liam, do we have questions? Um, yes, with Zoom. And so I want to start with the first question from Alexander. And the question, thank you for all panelists. Carl, the question is for Carl. Why is there no transparency from NYPD when internal in investigations happen? We don't hear about them. And of course, the people remain upset by the actions of the NYPD. Yeah. Um, I think we answered some of that earlier. I, I mean, I don't want to be defensive, but I think, you know, whenever you have um, a city official in the, from the mayor's office or from one of the city council speaker's office, um, those matters, if somebody is being disciplined or if there was sexual harassment, sexual assault charges, those are handled in-house with privacy and confidentiality as they are in any you know, public office. So in the police department, I think you know, officers wanna have some sort of due process just because I'm accused of doing something um, doesn't mean that I did it. So I wanna wait until that investigation is complete. Um, however, if, any, if, I, if I'm arrested, just like anyone else, if I'm given a summons, just like anyone else, those are all public activities that the public has access to. Uh, if I'm cleared of a charge, uh, you would probably never hear of it. Now, that law was recently changed, like one of the other people said earlier. However, I think it was one of the police unions that stepped in trying to make an argument that you shouldn't release all information, only things that have been proven if someone was found guilty. So even though that the law was changed by the city council, I think that there was also um, a pause put on it by court until we can figure out exactly what information is going to be released. So I, I do think this department is getting a lot better about transparency. Uh, in terms of releasing video from body cams quicker, in terms of making arrest of officers quicker. Um, and I hope you continue to see that. And I, I, I think that the public and you should hold us accountable for that if you don't, if you don't hear it. All right, so the next question is from Lana and- Not me. Yeah, different Lana. Some other, some other Lana, okay. okay uh, it's also a question for Carl. Um, you can lead by example, quit your job and refuse to work until your title and many others are relocated to another agency. And don't throw identity politics at white queers when the Marsha P. Johnson of our generations are still dying in Rikers and in our streets. The blood is on the hands of every NYPD officer. So how you would answer that? Uh, I don't think it was a question, right? That was a statement. I mean, there, there, there is a part of the question, right? Um, why wouldn't you quit your job and refuse to work until your title is moved? 
because I think I make more of a difference and do more to make things better by doing what I've been doing. So I disagree with some of the premise of that statement. Um, so yeah, can I add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, just working here as a civilian, um, and I'm a member of Goal Gay Officers Action League. Um, there's so much that is done by um, individuals within depart in the department that um, are identified with different groups. Uh, to make change within department and goal, you know, really works hard, you know, to um, to advocate on behalf of queer people and the queer community, like both within and without the department. Like, they will go, they will, they will advocate. And there's different groups, there's different fraternal organizations within the police department that are all trying to advocate for group for on behalf of of their group that they identify. We have Muslim police officers, we have black police officers who have an association, we have Turkish police officers. So, you know, the, the New York Police Department reflects the streets of New York City and, you know, the, and they do uh, work within to try and change, you know, for change, I should say. Uh, I, I, I want to say, Jeannie, that I, I hear you, I hear Carl, and then I see the videos. And, and that just does not work together. Something, I, I, I know what you're saying is truth, okay? But I also know that other things are also truth. And I, I can't reconcile it for myself. Um, well, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not a uniformed police officer and I don't have their training, but those, those, and I haven't seen the videos, but I know they exist, but it looks like, you know, um, you know, those look like frontline police officers who don't have as much training and yeah, there you know it seems to be a training issue. Like, but some you know, of like them are white seems... shirts, white shirts, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, they... they're lieutenants and captains. Lieutenant. So white shirts are, so you know, um, yeah. So you know, there's thirty six thousand police officers. So you know, forty five videos. You know, I understand. I understand. I'm I'm not yeah. I'm not going through I mean, the whole, but I'm I'm. I, just I, saying... I, 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 yeah, but we're talking about two different things, though. There's racism, and then there's what happened in the recent upheaval, which a lot of it was very chaotic, and, you know, it wasn't about racism. That was just, like, you know, trying to do crowd control and riot, riot control or whatever. But I think you're conflating two, two different issues if we're trying to talk about Black Lives Matter and defunding the police and, and the, mo the more recent stuff that happened you know, in the demonstrations where, you know, like those, all those videos, I think, came from the recent, the recent protest activity, which. Uh, it could, it could be, it could be. Uh, I, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask Sasha a question. Um, Sasha, um, if one wants to be involved, how, how would you recommend uh, to get involved? Where, where, where to go? Well, go. Or, do you have a path for people yeah. to be involved? Yeah. Um, I mean, so for there's lots of ways to be involved. I think one of the one key way is to to just start reading what's out there, right? Read books, read articles online. If you read things specifically about New York, you will hear about the groups who are who are working to make change. So, as was mentioned in my introduction. I have been organizing with Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, which we call JFREG. Um, that works for uh, police reform, among many other things. Um, so if folks are Jewish in the group, I invite them to reach out um, and join. Uh, there's also, um, so JFREG, the Campaign for Police Accountability is part of a broader coalition called Communities United for Police Reform. And that was a group that pushed really hard to repeal 50A and has been working on legislation and has a number of legislative wins um, over the years. So a lot of this, this activist work is around doing several things, right? It's legislative change, it's education, and it's protest. We tend to do all of those things. Protests are important for getting the message out there and for um, building momentum and, uh, and giving voice to the pain that people are feeling. Um, and legislative change is absolutely necessary and then education is all, obviously all needed. Um, so uh, you can look at their website. It's again, Communities United for Police Reform and they have a number of groups organizing. Um, if you're interested in uh, 
learning about racism as a white person for those in the call who are white, uh, showing up for racial justice surge um, is a national group that is uh, working on educating and organizing white people to work in support of racial justice. Um, and generally, like any research, if you're involved in any local group, um, any of those groups, you'll hear about more things and more actions. Um, Wear your masks, stay safe. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. I, I wanted to ask you, I obviously, I at least I couldn't catch all those. Uh, can you possibly send it to me in the email and we will share it with uh, our members? Yes. I think it's important to, uh, I, I, will know, I will tell you from my point of view, uh, as far as learning about racism, uh, uh, going to south of the country uh, with, the, with a group of people who uh, educated uh, us about uh, slavery uh, uh, had a tremendous impact on me. And uh, I think the more uh, education we can get, uh, the better we all understand the inequality in this country. And, and, and hopefully we will influence, uh, um, we will influence uh, a change. We will influence that the, the as, as Vernon said, the police functions as it's supposed to. We need to change how it's supposed to, uh, and and people people minds need to be changed, uh, uh, and their hearts need to be changed first. And I think that uh, that it's a responsibility of each individual to do that for themselves, uh, and we will help. Um, do we have anything else, Lib? Yes, we do. The next question is for. Um, Leosha or Vernon, so whom I want to answer it. So it's how do you communicate with Russian diaspora, who is racist, how you talk about defunding the police, and how you can explain to them um, that defunding the police is not going to affect their community. Yeah, I can start off a little bit that, uh, to be honest, at some point, it's very hard because uh, the problem is with the Russian speaking community, especially people, white, gay men who come here seeking asylum, that uh, the mentality of Russians is very sub, uh, sub, suppressive, right? So they've been living in that state of not being out, not being active, not being um, absolutely even uh, embracing their own sexualities. And when they come here politically, our mindset is very fragile. So when they come here and they think, okay, let, they don't think, they kind of produce that. So let's see what the political agenda, aha, uh -huh, now Trump is the president. Now he is against certain groups. In order to me being unsettled, being an immigrant, being not even given with some status, I don't have to say something controversial because it could cause me my status. That's why I'll stick, it's kind of, I'll stick with, with that general agenda. And after that, they, they come here, they white, as I mentioned, and they, from the victim point of view, they become a perpetrator because first time maybe they given some tools to uh, institutionalize their sexualities, their identities, because here being white, you still can do a, a lot of things. So, and people could disagree, but I see and I feel it and I know that, that most of their racism come we are from the lack of knowledge, they don't want to educate themselves because it's easier, it's easier to listen to some gossips, Brighton Beach babushkas. That's exactly how over 70% of Russian population operates in terms of news. We don't have tools to analyze, to produce our own knowledge. We stick to the fact. And if somebody says all black people criminals, they immediately stick because they think we, we saw them on the corner and we're afraid. Why we're afraid? Because we don't know anything about them. They're stranger to us. We never had the com communication. And the same with the Americans who believe that all Muslim people terrorists. So that, that propaganda, that brainwashing, and how we can start, we can start with uh, small steps to converse. Some people I gave up to um, educate because it's not working. They just blatantly shut you up and they state and you provide them with the information, they give you contrary. That's a great example with couple, I guess in St. Louis, who contradicted protesters with the guns. So they uh, 
big mansion and you see that uh, white lady and white man, what Russians do, they go and report the story, how the beautiful couple restored that fucking mansion for 30 years uh, and they wanted to protect their property. But people even don't know that people did not thread them. They were cutting through the private street, not even they mentioned, and they threatened them without any reason. And people do not balance those facts. So that's why my disappointment with Russian speaking communities, and I already expressed it on the Facebook. So if you want people to believe that you got persecuted in Russia, uh, by police and institution, do not tell black people here they are not brutalized by the police because you are not the part of this history. So we have to have the conversation like that. I posted some books and very good book I will recommend to all of you, it's uh, White Fragility, which is uh, amazing guide, amazing guide how white people not necessarily racist, but we still have the privilege of skin. So we have to challenge ourselves. We have to be contradictory. We have to be very uh, uncomfortable with some questions. We have to be uh, challenged and uh, do not take it aback because Russian people usually uh, in defensive mode. So no, it's not happened. We're not racist, said Brighton Beach, but they are organized against uh, black people. So for me personally, education plus very radical approach to educate those people. Wow! Thank you, thank you. Fair enough. Thank you, thank you. That was a, that was a strong statement. Uh, obviously, I, I I think we all here agree, but if we don't, uh, please, this is a time to discuss and uh, um, uh, propose your 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 different opinion here. Leah, how, how are we doing on questions? I, I think uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I should ask Vernon. Did you want to say uh, reply to that? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry about that. Like, like Carl, I, I, I follow Losha, and that's not easy <laughs> 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 either. Um, I, I guess my experience with the diaspora, um, as I mentioned earlier, I have essentially just distanced myself from the community here. Um, I have still friends that, you know, like Leib and Losha and, so my, and Lena and, and people who I still speak to and, and, you know, if they need me, I just call, throw up the bat signal, I'm there. Um, others, uh, honestly, I just hear trickled information from. They don't speak to me or ask me questions or information. You know who does ask me questions, Russian speaking? People in Russia, in Ukraine in Belarus. I get messages from my friends there asking me, in short, what the F is going on in America. Um, some messaged me in con out of concern. Uh, they thought I was, you know, because they know I'm in New York and they saw the, the news and, and was worried something had happened or something would happen to me. And that I appreciate. But interesting enough, as a kind of a, an addition to what Losha is saying is when Folks come here, it's a license to be a dick. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know how to put it another way, but it's like a license to treat other people as you were treated at home. I've got a message particularly about the two people in front of the mansion, uh, my friend um, Eugenia in, in, in Moscow. He didn't quite understand, two people actually, from Belarus and Moscow from the same story. He didn't quite understand what was going on from his perspective and of course russian news these were two innocent americans in their 40 year old mansion with millions of dollars who decided to protect their private property with guns i explained to him there a there was no reason to it's not like this mansion stood on a hill all by itself this is a community of homes only this couple saw fit to come out and brandish weapons against a crowd of people who were a mixed crowd. Their actions were not born out of fear because fear, you don't walk out of your house with a rifle. That's not fear, that's confrontation. And I explained to him as well that the, what these protesters were actually protesting. These protesters were protesting against police activity and the mayor of that town decided to publicly announce 
every letter that she received and their address. There is a reason for this protest. That, that wasn't explained and not expressed, especially on Fox, and definitely not in Russia. So the other thing I posed to my friend in Belarus, who was insistent that you know, they had a, a right to defend their, their land and property, whatever it is, I said this, if they were in fear of their life and this crowd was armed, as he believed, what are two yeah. people with guns going to do against a crowd of 50 to 100 people if they were armed? Nothing but die. That's it. And it would, take, it would take a peaceful protest and turn it tragic. And unfortunately, the news would read as the black, brown, whatever, came into this community of million dollar houses and decided to start an issue and kill two innocent white people. That would be the story. The, after the conversation with both, one of the Belarus friend of mine, he was a little less racist, but he understood better. The one in Moscow thanked me. The one in Ukraine thanked me. They needed to hear, they don't know. And I also sent them a couple of links to a couple of historical things that they can read on, just briefly, because I didn't want to overwhelm them as well. And now, I think a couple of weeks later, uh, Jamie particularly, Mark, we, we just talk, um, said thank you. Because after that moment, he followed the links and the links and the links and the links that fall over. And even though his English wasn't that strong, it took him a while to read it, he now has a clear understanding of the historical aspect of why things are here. The sad part about that, because that's a brilliant, beautiful story, is the, the Russian-speaking diaspora that's here not a, well, not a single one that isn't my close friend already, reached out and asked questions. Was curious, wanted to know if I was okay, Did, didn't understand something. Even though they're still on my friends list, I may not speak to them. Uh, I haven't quite removed them. Um, none of them did. I did get some messages about certain people who are friends of mine and some of the things they posted um, that were particularly not friendly towards black people, but uh, I didn't reach out to them. I didn't speak to them directly. I think moving forward, I invite them all, anyone. Anyway. Um, unfortunately, we can't just sit around and have a beer somewhere and talk, but you know, you can message me, DM me, call me if you have questions. I definitely have historical things you can read. Losha has lots of things you can point out as well. Um, I think Americans are also missing a part of the story of this country. That is hugely the problem because immigrants, to, to Russian diaspora or not, they're following the lead of their home country. So if they're frightened, which is understandable from my understanding, if you're from Kazan or Rostov or somewhere where the nearest black person is a continent away and you come here in New York particularly and we're everywhere, a little uncomfortable, someone you haven't seen before. I get it. But if you smile, shake your hand, shake their hand and, and greet, there isn't a human being in the world that doesn't return a handshake or smile back. Do it. And if you have a suspicion or a question or an uncomfortability about it, question yourself why that is. You haven't met this person. You don't know about this person. Now, if they're standing in the corner with a weapon, okay, <laughs> don't go there. But the general public of, of brown, black, Asian, whatever people, there's been times when I've been in one of those moods where I was just wanted to be super friendly. I would just walk up and say hi and keep walking. Or I would just say, hey, nice shoes and keep walking. That by itself of someone who's not like you changes their opinion of people different than they are. Try that. Historically for American people, you guys need to read. <laughs> I, there's no excuse for you. The, the history is there. The excuse, I give, I'll give you that, is that it's been deliberately erased, like city, the history of Tulsa completely annihilated. This is the history of Black people who succeeded, who as a town, a city, was one of the wealthiest towns in the country, except for outside of it, which was white Oklahoma. They decided to burn it down, create a reason, create a rape, cause and burn it down to the ground and bury everyone up in there. They still can't find the bodies. That is the history of African-Americans in this country and why 
were angry and why we've peacefully tried for decades, a century, and no one's listening. This is the time, thanks to people like Sasha and, 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 and even Jenny and, and even, even Carl. People need to be given a chance as individuals to prove who they are to you. I can honestly say I've never met Carl, but I can't say I have a bad opinion or feeling about him at all. Not saying I'm a fan of cops in general, but I take them as they come individually. And I don't see anything wrong with them. And I don't see anything wrong with the two officers who I had this great conversation with after my neighbor was, who I don't even know who the neighbor was, but he was killed. Um, we all want to be valued for who we are. I think it is an injustice to every person you encounter or the people who are behaving this way, to humanity, to just outright just dismiss someone because you don't, you're not comfortable with the way they look, comfortable with who they sleep with, who they love, who they're married to. If it makes you that uncomfortable, zip it, walk away, go in a different direction. There's no reason for you to shout, to say things, to say hurtful things, to be cruel, to say disparaging things about another race or whatever it is, because it's just ignorance. It's just, you just don't understand and know what you're talking about. And if you want to be ignorant, America, you will, you're perfectly allowed to. What you're not allowed to do is to actively convert and create an atmosphere of fear for everyone else. I guess that's pretty much all I have to say regarding that, but again, Feel free, anyone on this call or anyone who knows someone on this call who, needs, who is open to having a discussion, reach out to me and Losha anytime. And we will, and we will. We will, Vernon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Vernon, for your answer. It was a very good point. And so we have six minutes left. And I'm suggesting for everyone on the panel, give like, um, final thought of where are we going and what we should do next, where we, where we should go from now. Okay, I'll take it first. So from my perspective as an educator and professor and activist, I believe that uh, we should be radicalized and in, in, not radicalized, radicalized, but radicalized in our thoughts, how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive the community and uh, how we can together understand if something do not understand. I totally agree with Vernon, we have to ask questions and if questions are uncomfortable, uh, you still have to ask them because otherwise you will not learn anything. And I totally hope that we will proceed with the um, events within the Russell LGBT, but as well, uh, I urge everyone to uh, educate themselves if you do not understand, because all of us, regardless, have biases. We are biased because we're human beings. And we sometimes have some, uh, but before staying, as Vernon said, zip it up, think it over, and uh, come to some conclusion, or go to the groups, to reach the groups uh, before uh, acting somehow. And uh, sometimes it's, it's complicated. And do not be afraid to stand up to your own community to your own people and to your own fears and do not use that uh, uh, populi populist uh, idea that if we within the Russian speaking community, we have to melt with them and amalgam with them. It's not necessarily the same was I will tell to queer people, if you want to educate homophobes, tell about yourself. So that's my point of view. Uh, if I may add just for a second, um, it was really nice and to listen, it was really, um, useful to me as well. Um, I think that the part of the problem with Russian-speaking community is that so many people who came here, especially as members of our, as members of our community, they never fought for their rights back in home countries and they were given the rights that they have in this country and uh, after they moved to a new country they have lots of struggles and problems with job, with housing, with, I don't know, uh, lots of things going on and they have no time to think, to articulate, to reflect and um, probably it's our responsibility because we have the privilege of uh, like we have extra time, we have free time, we can commit to it um, and we can try to educate to make these people question their own uh, beliefs 
you know, uh, it's hard, but I think that if we do long enough, we can change something. Uh, and part part of it is a problem with English to me because people uh, people do not speak English very well, and they do not uh, they do not have the right resources. And many of them, I am from Russia, and I know that people who come from Russia they keep listening to Russian news and they keep reading in Russian, and unfortunately. Uh, there are not that many resources um, for for those who read in Russian about about racism in America. Yes, um, as of uh, my relationship with NYPD, um, I don't know. Uh, I I try to do my own research. I think the institution is inherently ineffective, and I do believe that it should be defunded in some part. I don't know how. I don't know. Uh, what what approach is right or wrong, but uh, I would leave it to the conscience of Carl or anyone who works with NYPD directly to decide whether it's easier to leave NYPD and criticize it from outside or to try and bring this change uh, like from inside. Uh, but as well, it's just really important to, um, I don't know, um, to question yourself and ask every single day if I'm doing the right thing, because it's really hard uh, to, uh, you know, to stay on track. And it's just the psychology of human being, I guess. Uh, people, unfortunately, will find justification for anything that they are doing. Um, and I'm used to that. And I have seen people who work with the Russian government that is like extremely homophobic, or people who work with lawmakers who past anti-gay law and they will find a justification for this title in Russian constitution that prohibits same-sex marriages. Uh, I don't know, um, it's just, uh, it's extremely subconscious sometimes and we should, everyone should keep questioning themselves and I think that uh, this is the way we can bring change and I don't know, uh, make a difference. Thank you, Ezra. That was that was beautiful and a great point. The really great point. But I think the most important point is that it's still on you to 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 educate yourself, right? It's 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 still uh, not excuse. Um, Carl, do you want to uh, say a couple of uh, words? Uh, yeah, I'll try to keep it quiet because I saw yeah. Sasha was going to speak. I just want to say this. Um, I really enjoyed listening to everybody speak today. I think. These kind of conversations are great. They touch the surface, but they just need to be ongoing so we can get deeper into what's below the surface. I'm part of a group like this that's working with um, queer youth of color. And we've had a couple meetings and we're talking about the same thing, reform and defund and, and their experiences with the police. And I just think it's really important that communication and we just keep talking. And that doesn't mean just talking, but it also means listening and then taking action. And I, I would challenge some of the people who are on the phone today to to educate not educate that's the wrong word to to be open to understanding that some of your best allies might actually be inside of law enforcement and um i've had conversations with people throughout my history as a police officer um questioning why i do what i do and was it the right thing to do what i did um and i gave up a good career and took a huge pay cut to do what i did <laughs> um but I definitely am passionate about the change I think I've been able to bring and that queer people in policing can bring. And I think a lot of people don't understand the day, the day in and day out of policing and what we do. And I know there were some comments that, um, you know, this, the police, policing is doing what it's supposed to. It's keeping people down and other people up. And I'm, I'm, I teach a class and I cover those kind of topics. Um, but I also think it's, there's there's more to it than that and we should just really understand the, the activists on the outside are just as important as the activists on the inside and we all want the same thing we all want change so we have to find a way to talk to each other better so that we can use each other as allies instead of seeing each other as the enemy thank you thank you very much carl thank you uh we have sasha and and vernon uh pl please guys remember we already passed 8 p.m we're all tired so if you could just make it brief thank you so much thank you yeah, very, very quickly. Um, this is Sasha's personal theory of change. Um, I think it requires three things, education, therapy, and systems change. 
And I think like as Russians, we like to argue loudly, but so much of that is just covering pain that isn't acknowledged, right? And when we feel like my pain, right, whether as a gay person or as an immigrant or as a Jew or as, like as a woman, whatever, hasn't been acknowledged, we often shut down to listening to other people's pain, right? So there's a lot of work in, on, in really letting go of some of that pain so we can hear other people when they tell us we're in pain. And then systems change is things like defund the police and laws. And I will add that one of the hardest things about systems change is that systems are only made up of people, right? They operate as systems, but the people, but the thing we do is we work with people to change them, right? And we're asking people to give up a lot. We're asking people to give up police to give up their jobs, their communities, people who matter to them. And that is a part of this work and some of the hurdles we will have to overcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Vernon, do you, do you want to say? Uh, just quickly, because I, I really haven't had more to add than, than Carl or, or Losha. I was thinking along the same, same lines. Um, just listen. I think that's the simplest thing. Um, a lot of the Facebook chatter is people talking past each other and no one, it, it, you, can, you can actually read and, under, and see people who are listening versus talking past each other. Just listen. You might actually learn something. You might actually learn you have more in common. I know it's a cliche, but it's actually real. You might actually learn you have more in common with that other person you're talking to. You may not agree on everything, I don't think any any group of people has 100% agreement, except for people in the White House. But but I think you will come to as common ground, whether you're in the police state police department or outside of it, that there's a common goal you can reach. You may have different ways to reach it. I can never ask an officer to quit his job that he pays for his his bills, rent, and family for, and it's something he's passionate about just to satisfy my need to say that I made an officer quit his job. I would rather, you know, attend one of his classes or speak to Sasha or something like that to find out what I can do within my range of abilities to, to help promote change. And that involves listening. Thank you so much, Vernon. Uh, I, I think it was just a perfect conclusion to, to our event. Uh, what we attempted to do here today, and I think we were somewhat successful, is to do listen to each other, to hear each other, to uh, uh, to really, really give each other time to talk, and 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 try to put ourselves in other uh, shoes and uh, understand something and learn something we didn't know. And uh, I I am very very grateful to our guests and everybody who made it happen today. Sasha, um, Losha, Vernon, uh, Carl, uh, Anatoly, who worked harder than anyone here today. Talk nonstop for over two hours. I cannot thank you enough. I, I, I just don't know, even know how you're sitting down and not falling. And I, 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 I am just so grateful that you gave us your time and everyone here who really uh, uh, put it together, Ezra, Lieb, um, Nicole, uh, e everyone, thank you so, so much. I, I promise you that we will continue this conversation. Werner, I, I, I promise you, you will be back. I, I think we are all gonna be back and probably as, as you said about, let's go in depth, uh, Carl, Next time we will uh, take a much more narrow, I thought the topic is narrow, but it wasn't as narrow as I thought. I think we're gonna narrow it down a little bit more and, and go into depth and, and, and hopefully people uh, like to be educated more. Yeah, thank you, Lena. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lushenka. Everybody, good night. Thank good, you very thank much. You. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, -bye. bye everyone. Thank you.